Amen. <laughs> Sometimes there's an abrupt start. Amen. Amen. I believe that Jesus is coming. What do you say? Amen. I am so thankful that we have this privilege of studying the Word of God. We continue tonight in our series on the identity crisis that we're in and the final generation. And by God's grace, I believe that we have begun to study something last night that uh, shows us the real issue that's at stake. In fact, we're going to find that what we started studying last night, which is the real issue, is in fact the most significant thing that we can study in all the Bible. It's the central thing. Do you, it's the plan of redemption. And you know, brothers and sisters, that a hundred million years from now, we're going to be studying what we're studying tonight. Now, if we're going to be studying this a hundred million trillion years from now, if we're faithful, then it means that we're on the right study. You know, the devil has a way of trying to divert us from the real issue to issues that are not really the central thing. You know that for a while, somebody would say, well, music is the central theme and everybody's talking about music or, or women's ordination and, and everybody's talking about that and fighting for that. All of these are smoke strings. The real issue does not have to do with a thing. The real issue has to do with a man. And what's the man's name? Jesus Christ. From beginning to end of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, he's Alpha and Omega. He's first and last. He's beginning. He's everything. Jesus is everything. And the real issue is Jesus Christ. And the reason why the plan of redemption is so important is because the beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. And if you want to understand the man, then we have to understand his plan. And so we found that the real issue is none other than the plan of redemption as it reveals to us Jesus Christ. Is there anything more precious than studying than that? Anything more precious than that? No. That's the greatest thing in all the world. So I'm thankful that we have this privilege to look into this. Would you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Esther, the second chapter, to the book of Esther chapter 2. And when you get there, if you will let me know by saying amen. We're going to Esther, the second chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, if we study that plan of redemption, we're going to find that the devil is afraid of something. The devil is afraid of what? He's afraid of something. Do you know that the devil is afraid of these meetings? The devil is more afraid of these meetings than you and I could ever be. You see, the devil understands that something is going to happen in these meetings that is to exalt Jesus. And that exaltation of his message and of the man has the ability to destroy Satan and his kingdom, and the devil is afraid of this. And that's why the devil will do everything in his power to keep you from coming every night. Now, I told you I was going to ask you something, and I'm going to ask it tonight. Was it hard for you to get here tonight? Yes. Yes. Somebody says no, somebody says yes. But I will assure you before the week is over, it will get harder. I promise you. Every night is going to get a little bit harder. Every night. And the reason why is because the devil is afraid of what we're going to learn. His eternal existence is at stake. And so the devil will do everything in his power. In fact, if all he has to do to stop you from coming is to send snow, what will he do? Talk to me. He'll send snow. If the devil can stop you by sending rain, guess what he'll do tonight? He'll send rain. If it's a hurricane, guess what he'll send? A hurricane. It doesn't matter what it is. I remember we were in Africa doing a meeting, and it was uh, in the largest uh, center of the, of, the, of the place, open pavilion. It was during the dry season. It hadn't rained for years. And I asked the people, I said, do you have a closed facility? They said, oh, we don't have to worry about that because it doesn't rain. I said, please, do you have a closed facility? Have you made preparation? And they said, but you have to understand the, 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 what the, 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 the conditions. We started the meeting. We got into the introduction, and guess what begins to come from the sky? Do you know that, 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 that there were flurries in Africa, snow flurries? The devil will do everything. Someone says, what, what, what could he do? The devil will even give you a job. Someone says, I don't have a job. I'm unemployed. The devil will give you a job this week. And someone says, well, the devil is nice. Well, it depends on why he gave you a job. <laughs> He'll give you a job this week and then fire you next week. Whatever it takes to keep you from coming. And so in your mind, what you have to do tonight is make up your mind that I don't care what the devil does. 
is not going to stop me from coming to these meetings and coming to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Do you want to make that commitment? Yes or no? Amen. What's more important than getting to know Jesus? Nothing. What's more important than the preparing for this crisis? You see, the devil is afraid of something. In fact, let me show you what the prophet says concerning this. The devil is afraid of something. Let's see what he's afraid of. In the book, Select the Message, book 1, 124, let's read that together. What does it say? It says, Father, please bless these words as we've opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, there is, what's that word? Nothing that Satan, so he's afraid of something. If the devil makes us afraid, I say we should make him afraid. What do you say? It says, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall do what? Clear the way by removing what? Every hindrance. So that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a, give me another word for language and give me another word. Dying church, sleeping church, and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would, what's the next word? Never, not sometimes, there would never be another, what's another word for awakening? Waking up. There would never be another awakening, great or, do you know that right now the devil's afraid of what's going on here? If there's only one soul here, but we're studying what we're studying, the devil will be afraid. It doesn't matter about the numbers. The devil's afraid of a message being understood. It says no matter how great or small to the end of time, but we are not ignorant of what? His devices. I'm telling you, you need to make it up in your mind. If the devil is afraid of this, then I need to begin to understand for myself what the crisis is. Now, because of the nature of these meetings, I'm going to have to remind you, if you come into a meeting like this, one of the first things you should do is cut off your cell phone. We shouldn't hear cell phones going off in a meeting like this. Am I right? Another thing needs to happen if someone comes in and sits down. The first thing you should do when you come in is to come in and find the seat and begin prayerfully praying for the Holy Spirit. No talking back and forth. You see, when God's presence is here, the Bible says, be still and know that I am. There's too much activity in and out, in and out. That is not conducive for encouraging the presence of the living God. We should say this. If someone else starts talking to us, we should just stop them and say, listen, I know that we want to talk, but, but, but when the meeting starts, we can talk after the meeting or a little bit before the meeting, but we don't need to talk during the meeting. You can just tell them in one word, why? Shh. What we're studying is so important that our eternal destiny is at stake. And brothers and sisters, we don't have long to learn. In fact, we studied the plan of redemption and found that there was something that is called the beginning of the end. Is there a time frame for this beginning of the end? Yes or no? When did we discover that the beginning of the end in a special sense would start? When did we discover? I can't hear you. I guess most of you weren't here, so it's okay. We'll study it again tonight. <laughs> the beginning of the end. In a special sense, will start 2020. Is that a long way away, yes or no? No. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's important for us to understand something, that the way we understand the significance is not that 2020 is a magical year, but if you understand coming events, something is happening that necessitates 2020 being the beginning of the end, if you understand what's coming. Who told us this? Jesus. He said, when you see all these things, events, come to pass, no. Don't guess. Don't ask your neighbor. No. Can we know the time? Yes or no? Now, the reason why we don't know the time is because we haven't allowed Jesus to help us to understand the real issue. But we're studying this week. We found out that this beginning of the year, uh, beginning of the end is marked and beginning by 2020. Now, inspiration says, let's read it together. We're going to start with this and end with this. Volume 9, page 20. What does it say? It says, are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end? Now, should we wait to the beginning of the end and then tell somebody we got to the beginning of the end? It says, are we to wait till the process of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be what? Now, can you imagine if a little boy was on a train track and a train's coming and is getting ready to knock the boy down, but it's just a little while before he hits the boy and you see him, but you say nothing. And then all of a sudden he gets hit. He's gone. He's dead. His mother comes out crying in tears. And then you go over to the mother and say, Mother, I knew the train was coming, but I didn't want to frighten him, so I didn't say anything. Is that love? What should he have done if he loved the boy? 
He go over and say, boy, get uh, 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 and the boy uh, uh, uh. startled. But his life is saved. You know what you would call that? You call that love. But now we have today a church, a, a group of seven Adventists that have been given a body of information that tells us what's coming, but we are afraid to talk about it because if we say something, we might frighten someone and people won't like us. You see, we don't understand who we are. God has given us a distinctive message, a distinctive mission. And my brothers and sisters, this says, of what value will our words be then if we wait? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him what? How to avoid them. Where is our faith? Where? Not in the man. Where is our faith in the word of God? Must we, what's the next word? See things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said? In clear, distinct rays, light has what? Prophecies come to us. Showing us that the great day of the Lord is what? Near. How near? At hand. Where? Even at the doors. What does that mean? That this generation shall not pass. We studied this last night. The generation, the, 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 the Bible text that talks about the beginning of the end in Matthew 24 tells us this very thing. Why would we wait until the end and then talk about it? Let us what? Read. And understand when? Before. It is too late. You know, when, you know when that time is? It's right now. It's right now. And we should let nothing distract us from right now. Nothing else that's happening in this room is more important than listening to who? Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, before this crisis happens, what is the greatest thing we can do as we approach the beginning of the end? What is the greatest thing we can do? Talk to me. What is it? We must get to know God. We made an acronym. What's the acronym called? Talk to me. C I P. What does C stand for? Close. close. Do you want to be distant from Christ or close to Jesus? What does I stand for? Intimate. intimate. Do you want to be just some casual friend of God or do you want to have an intimacy with Jesus? What does the P stand for? Personal. Do you want to know God as a group or as a church or as a family? Or do we need to know him personally? So then what does CIP stand for? Close, intimate, and personal relationship with God. This is the condition that we must be in. Now, when God wanted to teach his ancient people how to get to know Jesus as a friend, he said to them, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And the purpose of that sanctuary was to teach man how God and man can be brought back together. Where there can be an atonement and at one meant. Where God and man can be brought back together and have a close relationship. You see, sin does not bring us close to Jesus. What does sin do? Talk to me. It separates. Sin is a separator. Sin is a divider. So then sin is an enemy of friendship. So my brothers and sisters, it was sin that destroyed the relationship between God and man and the purpose of the sanctuary, the purpose of the plan of redemption is to restore in man a friendship with Jesus where we love him so much we would rather die than separate. That's close. That's intimate. And that's personal. That's what we need. Now, my brothers and sisters, this idea of 2020, although it's in the Bible, do you know that everything in the Bible is confirmed in history confirmed in the world events and we're told that the thinking men of this world world in education we're told this I read it last yesterday that the thinking men and women of this world that just before the crisis would recognize that it was about to happen did we read that yes. do they recognize that the crisis is coming yes. when do they say the crisis is beginning to develop the decline and fall of the what Here's another historian. Domestic and global trends suggest that in what? 2025, just 15 years from now, the American century could all be over except for a little shouting. In other words, he's saying that, see, what I want you to understand, when we look at this time frame from 2020 to what? 
It's not that we're waiting for 2020 or waiting for 2030. Do you know that as we move forward, it can happen anytime? We're showing you that it's about to be end up. This generation cannot pass. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found that this report said 40 years after the initial publication, a study called The Limits to Growth is Looking Depressingly Prescient. Commissioned by an international think tank in 1972, a report found that if civilization did what? continued on its path toward increasing consumption, the global economy will collapse by what year? So the thinking men, these are scientists, you will find in every field of knowledge, and before it's over, perhaps I'll show you. I'll show you, I'm not talking about just the religionists, not just the seven Adventists, not just the Christian. We'll show you that the historian, the anthropologist, the one who deals with economy, the one who deals with the study of population, the one who deals with disease, the one who deals with sickness, the one who deals with every field of knowledge in the world, every one of them tell us that something is developing. Now, my brothers and sisters, all we're doing is showing us that the Bible is confirming or showing us and history in the world are confirming what the Bible has already taught us. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says... Uh, as a report by an Australian broadcaster, the model's calculation took into account what? Trends in what? Now, did Jesus tell us there will be pollution, yes or no? In Matthew 24, when he began to start talking about the different pestilences and diseases, he talked about this. Now, this says, what not only pollution levels, what else? Did he tell us about population growth, yes or what? Yes or no? Like it was in the days of who? Noah. Was there a particular population in the days of Noah? What population is that? Right where we are where? Right now. Population and growth. The amount of what? Did he tell us to look at natural resources? He said there will be famines. Famine. Famine of what? Famine includes two great things. Famine of bread and water. Food and water are considered famine. Those, what is food? It is a natural what? Resource. What is water? It is a natural what? Have you heard the news that in India, no water? One of the biggest cities in India. No water. They're fighting over water. If you look at history, do you know that the Water Institute themselves have put out a report and said that by 2020 and 2030 that there will be a worldwide crisis over clean water. And blessed is that man that can walk out of his house and not have to drink from the city system of water. Blessed is that man that when he gets water, he doesn't have to buy it or sell it. He can go down and to a spring and it bubbles out and he can drink it. No buy, no sell. Blessed is that man. Now, my brothers and sisters, we've been told that this will be a crisis. We're going to show you. But notice what it says. It says, the model's predictions for the worsening quality of life and the dwindling natural resources has so far been what? You ever heard of something called peak oil? You ever heard of peak oil? Peak oil is when the amount of producing oil comes to a limit and then it begins to start reducing. Do you know that already the oil for the world has already reached its peak? Do you know that everything that makes what we call a civilized society is based on that oil? And if that oil becomes peak, then this world goes back to what is called the horse and buggy days. And man doesn't know how to live like that. In fact, 2020 is what? The first mouthful stone. That's when the quality of life is supposed to drop how? Dramatically. At around 2020, the condition of the planet becomes highly what? Now, my brothers and sisters, 2020, someone says, we don't have to worry about that. That's a long way away, or is it? My brothers and sisters, if we're in 2019 and we're approaching this, that tells us that whatever we do, guess what? We need to do quickly. Our children need to understand this. Our families need to understand this. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is the greatest thing we can do as we approach this? Get to know God. How many steps? Three. Are you sure? Yes. How do you know? Three steps. How do you know? God's way. Thy way, O oh God, is where? How many places connect to the sanctuary? What are the three places? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Those three places represent the three things that need to happen in order to bring man back together with God. It talks about how to restore that relationship. Getting to know God, three steps. Now, in that three-step plan, we talked about last, uh, yesterday, what is the first step in the plan? What's the first step? Uh -uh. 
Getting to know God is the experience. That's the objective. That's not the step. What is the first step in getting to know God? What is the first step? Now, don't sound like confusion. Amen. <laughs> What's the first step? To know and what? Is that in the Bible? Where? Now, 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 now there should never be a time we're in a class and we've studied it yesterday for me to say, is it in the Bible? You say yes, and I say where, and you get quiet. How can we do evangelism like that? Now, if you brought somebody here and this is their first night, the first thing they should do to you, if you get quiet, you should look at them and say, now, why are you getting quiet? Weren't you here last night? <laughs> Didn't you ask me to come? First Chronicles chapter what? Twelve. Let's go there quickly. Let's go. We'll come back next time. This is so important. I want to make sure you get this. I need it. You need it. We all need it. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 and we should come. 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 12 and we should come and get this. Now, first thing we have to do, if we're going to study the Bible, what do we need to bring with us? What do we need to bring with us? Now, let me see if you have a Bible. Raise up your Bible if you have a Bible. Now, please don't lift up your iPad. That let me know you lost your mind. Praise the Lord. Yes, yeah, sister. That's the Bible. <laughs> That's the Bible. And she, man, she must have woke up early this morning. That's the Bible, yes. So, my brothers and sisters, we got to get back to Bibles. Put down the electronics. Get back to the Bible. I'll never forget, I was at a meeting one time, and far away from here, so it, it protects the, day, uh, the guilty. But far away from here, we are during the meeting, and uh, we were, uh, like a week of prayer, just like this, and a man was uh, opening up, and he was, every time he would read, he had one of these electronic Bibles, he'll come up, and he'll start reading the electronic, and he, he'll make it look nice, he'll come you know, when you have electronic, you almost try to look important. And, I, and you know, as the night went off, I just said, Lord, please do something. Not to the man. I let the man praise God for him. But do something to that so-called Bible. I praise God. About the third night of the meeting, he stood up. And, and the Bible says, and he turned to the Bible. Oh, my Bible went out. I said, praise God. <laughs> Battery messed up. But praise God, this real Bible, it doesn't need a battery. You don't have to charge it. You can leave it out all night long and never put it into a charger and still there's power in the word, brothers and sisters. If you have to plug up your Bible, then you don't have a Bible. That's the test. That's the yardstick to measure if you have a Bible. Do you need to plug it up? Now, my brothers and sisters, in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32... What does the Bible say in verse 32? What does it say? Talk to me. It says, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had what, everybody? Did they understand the time? Yes or no? Yes. We found that Romans 13, 11 says, and that knowing the time. We're to know and understand the time. What's the second step if we're going to get to know Jesus? What's the second step? Talk to me. To we have to know what to do. What text in the Bible tells us that we need to know what to do? What text in the Bible? Same text. What, is, it, does, is it there? Let me make sure it's there. What does it say? He had understand the times. What for? To know what Israel ought to, to do. Now, if we know what to do, we can get ready. We can be prepared. But in order, to, in order to have a preparedness, we have to know what to do. Now, my brothers and sisters, there is a relationship between knowing the time and knowing what to do. To everything, there is a season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born. A time to die. A time to sow. A time to, uh, to, 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 to read. There's a time for everything. So if I do something, there must be a time. So if the devil doesn't want me to know what to do, he must confuse me on the understanding of the time. But if I know the time, I will know what to do. Is that the last step? Just knowing what to do. Is that the last step? What's the third and final step in this three stages of getting to know God? What's the third and final step? Talk to me. Now the third step is to do what he says. Does the Bible say so? Where? Uh, where? Where? Where does the Bible say that? John. John 15. Let's go there. Let's go there. John 15. We'll come right back to Esther 2. Go to John 15. Go to John 15. Now, if anybody knows how to become the friend of God, I think it's Jesus. What do you say? John 15, we have Jesus talking about friendship. The plan of redemption. That's the burden of this text. John 15 and verse 14. Let's read that together. John 15 and verse 14. Put these two texts together. So important. What does verse 14 say? All together. Are oh, my friend. Do you want to be God's friend? Yes or no? Yes. What does it mean to get ready for the crisis? It means that we have become the friend of God. 
Now, the Bible says, you are my friends no matter what you do. Is that what it says? Now, that's what many people teach in religions. The Bible says, you are my friend. What's the next word? If. What does if suggest? Condition. So it says, I thought that God's love was unconditional. It is. Does God love the sinner? Does God love Satan? Yes. In hell fire, will Satan be lost? In hell fire, will sinners be lost? Does God still love them? Then why hell fire? Hell fire is an expression of love. And the reason why there's no hell fire now is because we don't understand God's love. But once we understand that hellfire, judgment is an expression of love, then God will allow hellfire and it will be looked upon not as an act of vengeance or an act of anger. It will be looked upon as an act of love. You know what you do to a dog that you love? And the dog, his limbs are broken. His body is broken. He can't, it's a, it's a struggle for him to exist, but you love that dog. Do you say, I love the dog, so I'm going to let him suffer? Is that what you say? What do you say? You put him to sleep. And there's another word you say about that. You put him out of his misery. Do you know that hellfire is doing nothing but putting us out of our misery? It's a love. It's the love of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we understand that, then we say God's love is unconditional, but friendship is conditional. The Bible says, how do we know? Who told us this conditional? Jesus. I think he knows. Verse 14 says, you are my friends. If, if what, Jesus? If ye, what's the next word? Do. If we do what Jesus says, what will be the end result? You will be my friends. So my brothers and sisters, that's a three-step plan. Become his friends if we do by God's grace what he says. Now question, can we do what he says without Jesus? No. But he told us, if he told us, that's enough. Can we do it without him? No. no. The Bible says in the same chapter, verse 5, John 15, 5, it says, without me, you can do nothing. So my brothers and sisters, if we're going to do what he says, whether it's in diet or dress or music or worship or living, if we do what Jesus tells us in the Bible, we can become the friend of Jesus. That's a simple plan. What's the first step? Know and understand the times. What's the second step? Know what to do in the times. What's the third step? That by God's grace with Jesus do it and we can become God's what? So then what are we studying in these meetings? How to become the friend. So if anybody asks you, you say, look, I've been learning about the beginning and the end. I found out how to become God's what? Friend. Do you know that's the, the biggest thing that, that, that there's an opening to evangelism? Somebody come to you at work or, or some other job, it doesn't matter what their religion, it doesn't matter because all of us need to become the friend of God. The Muslim needs to become the friend of God. The Buddhist needs to become the friend of God. The atheist needs to become the friend of God. The Catholic, the Baptist, the Pentecostal, the Seventh-day Adventist, everyone needs to become God's what? Friend. That's the message. That's the message. Now, my brothers and sisters, then someone comes to you and says, look, I found the most important thing in all the world. The world is coming to an end. I found out how to become God's what? Friend. They say, how? You say, look, this is what it is. First Chronicles, you must understand the, you're right there in the beginning of this study right now. Why do we need to understand time? Because then it teaches us what to do. And if we would do by God's grace what he says, we can become his. Now, my brothers and sisters, then if you were the devil, what would you do? I would stop this experience. Where does the devil start, start to stop this experience? Because the question is, why do we spend so much time studying time? Someone says, oh, you seven at Venice, all you do is study time and prophecy. Oh, that's all you're about. Now, if you understand, you would say, thank the Lord. Amen. Because if you study the life of Jesus, the very first words that he said when he preached the gospel was, the time is fulfilled. That's how Jesus taught. This is his message. This is what we must do as seven Adventists to imitate Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we understand that, then we can see the devil's plan is to stop us from step one to not know and understand the time. Because if we don't know the time, we can't know what to do. And if we don't do it, we can't become God's what? Friend. So then the devil start, starts by doing that. So the question is, which one of the three things is designed to set friendship in motion? Which one? No, I can't hear you. Doing what? Knowing and understanding the time. And so you know that we need to spend a great deal of time knowing the time. You remember Esther's day. You're back in Esther 2. In Esther's day, you remember the words of Esther? It says, who knoweth that you have come to the kingdom for what? Such a time as this. I'm going to tell you something. Who knows but you've come to this me, to this week of prayer for such a time as this. Now question. 
Did Esther prepare her people for a crisis? Yes or no? Did Esther save her people under the hand of God? Yes or no? Did she help more than her people? Yes or no? Do you know that everybody in that Persian kingdom were saved as a result of Esther's work? Not only her own people, but everybody that was under her influence because of her work. And do you know that at Seventh day Adventist, we've been given the same work as Esther. Not only to save our own people, Seventh day Adventist, but we have a duty to do something to help our other brothers and sisters in every denomination, every religion, and every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And as Seventh day Adventists, we're not doing our jobs if we're not helping the world. Now, my brothers and sisters, Esther, in order to get ready for that crisis and prepare her people, there were three things that she had to do. How many things? Three. The first, write it down, please. I'm going to test you on it tomorrow. You notice that every night I review and test you. What's the first thing that Esther had to do? The first thing that Esther had to do, first, let me ask you this. No, the first thing she had to do, I'll tell you first now, actually. First thing she had to do was to realize her distinctive identity. That was the first thing. She had to recognize and realize her distinctive what? Was Esther distinct, yes or no? In fact, it's amazing that most people don't know that Esther was not her name. That wasn't her real name. The Bible tells us in Esther 2, that Esther's name was not Esther. That wasn't her real name. That wasn't her distinctive name. That was her slave name. That was her Persian name. That was her name that made her fit in with the Persians. You see, they didn't have names like Esther had where she came from. They didn't have names like that in Persian. They had those Persian names. Esther, doesn't, you know what that sounds like? Esther, Easter. It's pagan, brothers and sisters. So my brothers and sisters, when that name was there, look at Esther chapter 2, verse 7. Look at verse 7. Esther 2, verse 7. Let's read that together. You're there, amen? And he brought up, what's the Bible say? Hadassah. That is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was what? Fair. She was beautiful. Yes. Now you better understand, the burden of every text is to reveal the plan of what? You see, the beauty of Esther was just a faint reflection of the beauty of the man, Christ Jesus. Now, it says she was fair and beautiful whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own what? Question. He was the uncle. Question. Why did she not say her name was Hadassah? Why did she change it uh, 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 to Hadassah? Uh, why did she not say it Esther? Why did she uh, use the name Esther? Why did she not? Because Mordecai told her it wouldn't be the best. Just meld in with the rest of the kingdom. Don't look different. Don't look distinct. But later on, he recognized that was not the best instruction. Before the crisis, she had to recognize, because remember, she was in the palace, and Mordecai came and said, wait a minute, Esther, don't think that because you're in the palace, you, you're in the Hilton Hotel. Don't think that because you're in there, that you're going to get away from the crisis. He said, you must embrace your distinctive what? So what was the first thing Esther did? Talk to me. She had to what? Realize and recognize her, not just identity, but her distinctive. What does it mean, distinctive? It's unique, it's special, it's rare, it's different. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is the second thing Esther had to do? The second thing Esther had to do was not only recognize it, but you know it's possible to realize you're different and hate it. It's possible to realize that you don't look and act and uh, are like someone else and hate that distinction so much so that you want to hide that you're any different than anyone else. But Esther had not only to realize it, she had to embrace her distinctive identity and say, I'm not afraid or ashamed. You know, it's amazing that as Christians, as seven Adventists, sometimes we're afraid to be Christians. You know, the average person, they go out to a restaurant, they get ready to eat, and they know what they're supposed to do before they eat. You know what they're supposed to do? You were taught like a child. You were taught as a child, what were you supposed to do? Pray. You know what you're doing you're in that restaurant? You're afraid to pray. Something you, 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 in fact, if you pray, before you look up, you, did anybody see me? One family, they, they came up with agree, agreement. And before, before they go to the restaurant, elder, before they went to the restaurant, you know what they did? They prayed in the car. So that when they go into the restaurant, they don't have to look so different. Why are we so afraid? I'm going to tell you why. Because you're a slave. A slave doesn't like to be different. A slave doesn't like his distinctive identity. It's part of the process of making someone a slave. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, Esther, before the crisis, had to recognize her distinctive identity. She had to do what? Number two. Wouldn't it? What's number two? She had to what? Embrace that distinctive identity. And then number three, finally, she had to manifest, disclose, reveal that distinctive identity to the entire world. And doing this, God allowed her to save her own people in the world. I'm telling you, as seven Adventists, we've got to embrace our distinctive identity. We're not like any other denomination. Number two, we must not only realize it, but embrace it. Don't be afraid of it. There are many Christians that are looking to have the experience from the Bible. And we are have something that can help everybody in the world if we come back to the Bible. But today, it's sad that at Seven Adventists, we've lost sight of this. And number three, we're to reveal that to the world. And I'm telling you something we don't have long. Is the crisis developing, yes or no? Yes. So tonight, we want to jump back into this study more deeply. And what we're going to be studying more fully tonight is something called the great clock of time. What did I say? The great clock of time. The what? Great clock of time. Why are we studying time? Why time? Why do we need to know the time? So we can know what to do. Why do we want to know what to do? So we can become the friend of God. And so if we're going to become the great friend of God, we must understand the great clock of time. And so before we go deeper, I want us to stop and we're going to spend, how long talking to Jesus? How long? Two minutes. Two minutes. Is that a long time? Okay. Can we become the friend of God without learning how to spend time with God? No. Do you know to become friends with God, it takes time. And so we're going to stop here. Would you reverently kneel with me? Forget the congregation. Ask God, Lord, help me to get to know you. Help me to understand time. Help me to get this experience with Jesus. And after two minutes, we'll get deeper into our study this evening, the great clock of time. Forget this congregation and talk to Jesus. And after two minutes, we'll have a word of prayer up front and enter into our study more fully. Talk to Jesus. O oh, Father, which art in heaven. We're so thankful, Lord, that you're such a wonderful and loving God. That you would not allow crisis or calamity to take place without first sending us a warning. For surely, Lord, the, you will do nothing but reveal your secret to your servants, the prophets. When the world was getting ready to be destroyed the first time by a flood, you sent Noah. When Sodom and Gomorrah was getting ready to be destroyed by fire, you sent Lot. 
When the destruction of Jerusalem was getting ready to take place, you sent Jesus and the Christians to tell them that this generation was going to see the greatest crisis of that time. And before the world comes to an end this last time, you sent a special message. In Revelation 14, the everlasting gospel of three angels to prepare a world before it is too late. And Lord, we want that experience tonight to understand before it is too late, not just so we can pride ourselves on information and knowing things, but so that we can become your friends. We ask in a special way that you remove every distraction. You see, Lord, that what needs to happen, I cannot do. I'm too weak, too feeble, too ignorant. I plead for your wisdom, your power, your strength. I plead, Lord, that you would send the Holy Spirit in this room. That even those that pass by this church would recognize that you are in this place and, and that we will recognize that we have been in the presence of Jesus. Remove every distraction, focus our minds, and give us an understanding, dear God, tonight like never before. So that there can be a radical change in heart and life. So that we can become like Jesus. Bless us now, we pray. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in Revelation, the last book of the Bible in Revelation chapter 12. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Revelation chapter 12. Now, it doesn't take a theologian to understand that a crisis is coming. It doesn't take a historian to understand that a crisis is coming. It doesn't take a man who is so intellectual and intelligent to, to understand that a crisis is coming. If a man would just open up his Bible, if a man would begin to just study what the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation, he would recognize that we're not living in any ordinary times. We're living tonight in the midst of the most solemn and significant time of all the ages. We're living not at the beginning of time. We're living in the last days of this earth's history. And the Bible says that Satan's attack on this generation is greater than on any other. Why? As we studied last night, we understand this is not the first generation, but this is the what? Final generation. The limit generation. The last generation. Revelation chapter 12. Beginning in verse 12, let's read that together. What does the Bible say? It says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Why? For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath. Now notice the last four words. But a what, everybody? A short time. And we've been identifying this short time. The devil knows this time. In fact, brothers and sisters, we found that we're living in a day and hour where the devil is getting us caught up in everything but getting to know Jesus. Do you know right now that Satan has become successful and using every form of mass media to get our attention. He's using the television. He's using internet. He's using the computer. He's using social media. He's using Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook. And I've always said to myself, why does man have three Facebook accounts? He only has one face but has so many Facebook accounts. It doesn't even make sense. You see, brothers and sisters, all the devil is trying to do is to gather our attention away from that which is most important. And Satan has done his job well. You know that most of the hours that are spent today by other persons or persons in this world are spent watching movies, looking at Netflix. Somebody gets hooked up into the red box. But I don't care if it's a red box or a blue box or no box. The devil is trying to take us away from Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters... It's important for you and I to understand that we are wasting our time. And guess what? Time is running out. Look at what the prophet says concerning time. Inspiration tells us very carefully. It says here, it says, what shall I say to do what? Arouse the remnant people of God. I was shown that dreadful scenes are where? It's not some cakewalk. We're told that a troublous time is just before us and it says Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear upon God's people because he, Satan, knows that if they sleep, not forever, if they sleep, what does it say? Just a what? Little longer. He is sure of them for their destruction is what? Now notice what the prophet says concerning that. It says, my brother, my sister, if these precious moments of mercy are what? not improved, you will be left how? Without excuse. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that there are going to be many that say, Lord, I don't have any, I don't have an opportunity. I didn't have an opportunity to get ready. How can you let me be lost? Lord, give me more time and we're going to make all these excuses. And God's going to say, there's no excuse. 
I gave you an opportunity every day to study with me. I gave you a week of prayer calling us back to the attention. But during that week of prayer, you said that you were too busy, that you had to go to work and school and play. Now, it's amazing. We have time today for work. Time for school, time for play, but when it comes to Jesus, we haven't got no time. What's our problem, brothers and sisters? Why can we wake up in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, beat the Atlantic traffic, be at work all day long, another two hours, coming back home, and yet, Jesus, we can't give him 30 minutes. My brothers and sisters, amazing. We do for man something we won't do for God, and that's a problem. My brothers and sisters, inspiration says, there is no excuse. If you make no special effort to what? Arouse. You've got to make effort. I'm going to come every night. I'm going to study my Bible every day. I don't care what the devil does. You must make an effort if you will not manifest zeal in what? These golden moments will soon what? Pass and you will be weighed in the balance of the, of the sanctuary and found wanting. Then your agonizing cries will be what? Now, brothers and sisters, do you understand that many people when this crisis is over, that many people will start saying, Lord, I want to get ready when the crisis breaks. And it's going to be too late then. And God is going to say, if you're going to get ready, you must do it now. And do you know that if we are lost, God will show us every time that he sent warnings and messages to awaken us and help us. And you will see that instead of some minister standing behind the pulpit, angels were standing trying to impress your mind. Do what it takes to come. Do what it takes to study. Do what it takes to prepare. Why? Time is running out, my friends. And the Bible tells us very carefully. That if we make no, uh, no special effort to improve, we will be left without the, uh, uh, without the special experience with Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. Do you know the reason why most people don't spend more time with Jesus is because we don't see how attractive Jesus is. You know what the devil's plan is? The devil's plan is to try to make the world look so attractive and it so seduces us to sin because we don't spend enough time looking at Jesus. In fact, go to Psalms 96. What book did I say? Look at Psalms 96. On your Bible, Psalms 96. I want you to see that Jesus is attractive. And if someone's attractive, they don't have to force you to come. They draw you to themselves. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is so beautiful that one songwriter wrote and penned the song that says, Fairest Lord Jesus. I mean, there's nothing or no one as fair as Jesus. One songwriter says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The reason why sin looks so irresistible is because we don't look at Jesus. But my brothers and sisters, when man sees Jesus, they see the beauty. In fact, now Psalms 96, look at what it says. Psalms 96 beginning in verse 6. What's the burden of Psalms 96? Talk to me somebody. The plan of? Look at Psalm 96 verse 6. Let's read it together. What does the Bible say? It says, honor and majesty are where? Are before him. I love this part. Let's read it together. Strength and, what's the next word? Talk to me. Beauty are where? In his sanctuary. So if you want to see the beauty of the man, you've got to understand his plan. And that plan is going to take us in the sanctuary. You see, when you understand the sanctuary, the beauty of Christ begins to become paramount. It's revealed. And by beholding Jesus, we become changed. And so the devil's plan is to keep us from an understanding of the beauty of Christ. You remember the expression last night? The beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the... So in order to know the man, you must first understand his plan. And so my brothers and sisters, if we would spend time looking at the beauty of Jesus, understanding the real issue, the plan of redemption, do you know that there will be born in our soul the spirit of urgency? No longer can we be careless and indifferent. No longer uh, can we be passive and complacent. We will see the need of getting ready and getting ready, not tomorrow, but getting ready right now, getting ready fast. In fact, look at John. What book did I say? We're going to the Gospel of John. John chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says in John the ninth chapter. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. My brother and sister in John chapter 9, it tells us that of all the Bible, no one was more urgent than Jesus. Was Jesus urgent? Yes or no? Yes. You remember when Jesus came preaching the gospel? He didn't say, listen to the gospel because 100 years from now, something's going to take place. He said, listen, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is not far away. It is at what? Hand. It's near. It's now. He was urgent. 
You remember Jesus when he was getting baptized by John? John was getting ready to baptize him. John saw his beauty. And John looked at the beauty of Jesus and got, he got a flabbergasted. Whoa, he said, whoa, whoa. All of a sudden, he said, I can't even tie the shoe latchet on your face. He was hypnotized. But a good hypnotist. It was a true trance. It was the beauty of the man, Jesus Christ. And when he saw that beauty, he was almost struck. But remember now, he had to be baptized on time. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so when? Yeah. Now. Jesus was urgent. Don't you remember Jesus when he was talking to Judas? He said to him, whatever you do, do what? Quickly. What about Zacchaeus in the tree? He said, Zacchaeus, don't come down slowly. You know what he said? He said, make what? Haste. My brothers and sisters, Jesus had the spirit of urgency. Does the Bible say so? Yes. Look at John 9. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, before I read this, some of us say, well, why are you pointing this out? Let me tell you why. The reason why I take the time to point this out is because when someone comes preaching like Jesus with the spirit of urgency, when someone comes preaching like you're hearing preach tonight, today, this week, this generation, all that's going to happen this generation, the first thing the devil does, because remember, the devil's tricky. Now, I want to expose his tricks. The devil is tricked. Hey, listen, let me tell you how he tricks us. One thing he does, he will say, first thing he says, when someone comes preaching like this, they're fanatic. And you're afraid of fanaticism, so he knows that all you do is call you fanatic, and you, you run from it. Another word he likes to call extremists. Legalist time setter. Oh, he loves that one. Time setter. Legalist, fanatic, extremist. And when a man hears those words, he gets afraid. And so he begins to run from the spirit of urgency. And instead of getting ready, he begins to get lax a days ago. Oh, well, I don't really have to get ready now. I can wait to change my life. I don't need to make a radical change now. He doesn't understand the significance and the importance of the spirit of urgency. So I want you to know tonight. That when you embrace the spirit of urgency, that you're on safe Bible grounds following a man whose name is Jesus. Look at John 9, beginning in verse 4. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, I must, what's the next word? Work the works of him that sent me. That's an urgent man. I can work it as long as I want because, you know, I can work it any time in history. Is that what he says? Uh -huh. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me when? While it is what? What does he mean by day? In other words, he's talking about time. He understands the time. He says, I must work the works at a certain time. While it is day, why? A time is coming. Why? The night cometh when what? No man can work. Was Jesus urgent? Yes or no? Yes. He understood that there was a time frame in which he's working on and Jesus was moving on time. Now, I want to ask you a question. What do we call a time when Jesus can no longer work for our salvation? What do we call that? The close of probation. And so Jesus understood the close of probation for the Jewish nation. And Jesus is saying, I've got to work because there's coming a time when I can no longer work for that nation as a nation. And Jesus was working with all his energy. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is it clear from the Bible that Jesus had a spirit of urgency? Yes or no? Yes. no? But my question is not, did he have a spirit of urgency? My question is, why did Jesus have a spirit of urgency? Was it because he was God and he knew everything? Is that why? Why was it? You see, Jesus came like us, God, man, but his flesh just like ours. He understood and learned as we can learn. The same way Jesus understood, we can. We're going to find that the same condition, or should I say position, that Jesus was in in his generation, the remnant church, you and I are in in this generation. Same position, same condition. So my brothers and sisters, my question is, why did Jesus have a spirit of urgency? Talk to me, somebody. We're in a class. Talk to me. Talk to me. He understood the time. Jesus, I heard somebody say back there. He knew there was a limit. Is there a limit? Yes or no? Did we prove that from the Bible last night? Now, if you weren't here, you need to get those texts. And the person that, you, that brought you doesn't have those texts. You need to say to them, shame on you. And then after the meeting, come to me and I give you the text. Amen. Amen. Now, it says he knew there was a limit. Now, my brothers and sisters, just as Jesus knew there was a limit, do you know that God wants us to know our limit? Now, my brothers and sisters, my question now is, how did Jesus know there was a limit? Now, follow for a moment. What year did Jesus start his public ministry? Uh -uh. What year did Jesus start public ministry? 27 AD. That was when he was baptized by John, 27 AD. Now, my brothers and sisters, when did Jesus' ministry for the Jewish nation end based on Daniel's prophecy? When did it end? 34 AD. 
How long is that? 27 and 34, how long is that? Seven years. Now remember, the number seven is very special in the Bible. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is built on the number what? Seven. Genesis starts with the first seven days. You'll see from Genesis to Revelation, the name is seven. How many churches in Revelation? Seven. How many candlesticks in Revelation? Seven. The sanctuary built on the number what? Seven. So the entire Bible built on number seven, special number, and seven always brings us to a limit. And so we find that Jesus knew these seven years was taking us to 34 AD. Now my question, brethren, my question is, did Jesus know that his limit was going to be in 34 AD? Yes or no? Was he going to minister to the Jewish nation in the flesh all of those seven years? Yes or no? He was going to be cut off where? In the midst, according to Daniel's prophecy. What year was Jesus going to die on the cross? 31 AD. Every Christian should know this. You know a seven Adventist should know it. He, he doesn't have a reason to be a seven Adventist. He don't know this. You know, this is the foundation of becoming a seven Adventist in our identity. You can't understand the sanctuary without understanding what Jesus did. Now, my brothers and sisters, you will find out that in 31 AD, Jesus went to the cross. Did he know he was going to the cross? Yes. Did Jesus know the year he was going to go to the cross? Yes. Did he know the month he was going to go to the cross? Yes. Did he know the day he was going to come to the cross? Yes. Did he know the hour he was going to die? How? You will find that Jesus understood that there was such a thing called the great clock of time. The what? Great clock of time. And he knew that everything he did was a part of that clock. Someone says, are you sure about that? Yes, let me show you from the Bible. Go to John. What book did I say? You're in John 9. Go back a few chapters. John 7. Go to John 7. This is all throughout the Bible. We don't have time tonight to look at all the texts, but we'll look at some of the main ones. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, now what is the foundation or the burden of this text? The unfolding of the plan of? This is the key that unlocks every passage. John chapter 7 and verse 6. Notice what the Bible says in verse 6. Are you there, amen? Let's read verse 6 together. What does the Bible say? All together it says, Then who? Jesus said unto them, My, what's the next word? Time. Did he know about the great clock of time? Yes or no? He said, my time is not yet come, but your what? Time is already come. It's already. He knew his time. He understood the great clock of time. In fact, look at the verse 8. John 7 verse 8. Look at verse 8. It says, go ye uh, up unto this feast. I go not up unto this feast. Why not? For my time. My what? My time is not yet for. Did he know his time? Yes or no? Did he understand there's a great clock, great clock of time? Yes. In fact, let's look at another text. Go to John chapter 8. Next chapter. Go to John chapter 8. Now, there are many, many texts. We'll just look at another one for, for sake of understanding. John chapter 8. Notice verse 20. John chapter 8, verse 20. And let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 20? It says, These words spake who? Jesus. In the treasury. As he taught where? In the temple. And no man did what? Now, they wanted to kill him, but they didn't. Why not? What does the Bible say? For his what? What does it mean by hour? His what? His time had what? Not yet come. So Jesus' whole life was on a timetable. It was on a time schedule. And Jesus understood it. Someone says, well, I see he understood his time, but why do you say clock? Why clock of time? Now, we have a clock in this room. When you look at a clock... What do you normally see on the clock? How many numbers on the clock do you normally see on those old-fashioned clocks? How many numbers? Twelve. So go to John chapter 11. Let me show you he saw a clock. Go to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, and we want to begin in verse 7. You remember the, the Martha had sent the message to Jesus saying, Look, Lazarus, he's sick. The man you love, your friend, he's sick. Did Jesus go right away, yes or no? Uh-uh. Jesus knew his time, and Jesus was working things out. He wanted to show a great miracle that would give more evidence of who he was so people could accept him and become the friend of God. John chapter 11, verse 7, let's read that together. The Bible says, then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into what? Yes. Judea again. In other words, he wanted to see Lazarus. Verse 8 says, his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late did what? Sought to stone thee, and goest thou. They, look, they're trying to kill you, Jesus. Why are you going back? Jesus said, look, they can't kill me. Not yet. Look what the Bible says in the next verse. Verse 9 says, Jesus answered. Notice the intelligence based on the Bible. Jesus said in verse 9, are there not, how many hours? Talk to me somebody. 
Now, what is he dealing with when he said 12 hours in a day? He's talking about a what? Clock. He said, are there not 12 hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not. Remember, I must work the works of him that has sent me while it is day. Because the night cometh when no man can work, but that 12 hours of the day has to do with the clock. He understood the clock of time. And he said, look, my time has not yet come. Because Jesus' life, his entire life was based on time. Now, I want to ask you a question. What was he studying to understand the great clock of time? He was studying the Bible. What in the Bible was he studying to understand the great clock of time? He was studying the real issue. What was the real issue in the Bible that he was studying? The plan of redemption. Well, how? Because everybody else was there. They had the sanctuary and the so-called plan of redemption. But what did he understand correctly that let him understand the plan of redemption that revealed the great clock of time? He was studying what? The sanctuary. The Bible says, thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Now, my brothers and sisters, he was studying the sanctuary. How many places? What are the three places? Outer court, what else? Holy place, what else? Did we prove that from the Bible yesterday? Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, what was he studying in the sanctuary that let him know the great clock of time? No, he wasn't studying the day of atonement. That wasn't what he was studying. He was studying. Go to Hebrews. What book did I say? Go to Hebrews chapter 8. Let me show you what you're studying. Go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, and we'll let the Bible tell you what you're studying. Now, I'm going to write something on the board, and I want you to, to tell me. If you know it before I finish it, you can say it out loud. But this is what he was studying. We're going to show you from the Bible. What were you studying? You remember? Now, now, if you could look at this board, what is on the board right now? Now, if you weren't looking at my hand, let, let's say this. Now, you can see my hand, but if you weren't looking at my hand, you're just looking at the shadow because you know if I'm moving by looking at the shadow. So even if you didn't see my literal hand, if you looked at the shadow, you would know what was happening. How many fingers? I'm at? Don't look at my hand. How many fingers on the shadow? How many? How many? How do you know? See, Jesus was studying the shadow. And the reality, the literal, was learned by the shadow. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Hebrews 8 verse 1, the Bible says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. In other words, he's summing up chapters 1 through 7. We don't have time to go through. We have such a what? Who is the high priest? Jesus. Who is the lamb? Jesus. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty, not on earth, but where? Amen. So where is Jesus a priest? Where is he a priest? Where? Amen. In heaven. So where is this sanctuary? In heaven. But that's where he's a priest. Verse 2 says, verse 2 says, a minister of the, now remember, thy way, O God, is in the, Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary, not on earth, but the one where, 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 in heaven. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer what? Look at verse 4. For if he were on what? He should not be a what? Now I want to ask you a question. If he was on earth, would he be a priest on earth? No. So then that tells me if we have a priest on earth, this is not Christ, this is? Yes. So any religion that claims to have a priesthood on the earth is because they don't understand the plan of redemption. Yes. Wrong plan, guess what? Wrong man. And the whole world is getting ready to wonder after the beast. Because they don't understand that a priest is not on earth, that the priest is in heaven. And the only message that gives this is tucked in the sanctuary. And God wants us to understand, understand our identity and reveal it to the entire world. But we can't give what we don't have. Verse 4 says, if you on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests and offer gifts according to the law. Well, what was the purpose? When the earthly sanctuary was set on earth, what was the purpose of that before the death of Christ? Verse 5 says... Who serve unto the what? Example. Who serve unto the what? Example and what else? Shadow. And shadow of what? Heavenly. So that means that the heavenly sanctuary was the real sanctuary, but the heavenly sanctuary cast a what? Shadow. shadow. And it cast a shadow on what sanctuary? Earthly. The earthly sanctuary. And by looking at the shadows of the earthly sanctuary, you would know what's going on in the heavenly sanctuary. 
So there's something called a shadow, another name for shadow. Give me another name for shadow. Type. Give me another name for type. Example. Now, my brothers and sisters, for example, I'll give you an example. <laughs> for example, a type is a lamb. When a sinner came to the sanctuary in Old Testament times, what did he bring if he believed in the plan of redemption? He bought a lamb. What was that lamb to do? Was that lamb to stay alive? The purpose of that lamb was not to live. The purpose of that lamb was to what? Die. Is it because the lamb was really what was supposed to happen, the dying of a lamb? Was that really what was going to save us? Is that what it was? The lamb was a symbol of who? So that when John saw Jesus in John 1, 29, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So that lamb was a shadow. It gave an example of what the real lamb would do. Just as I'm holding up two fingers and the shadow does, then whatever the shadow does, the literal thing does. So just as the shadow died, the lamb died. Jesus died in reality. Does it make sense, yes or no? So that's a shadow, that's a type, that is an example, but then the real thing is called not a type, the real thing is called an anti-type. An anti-type. So Jesus, lamb, type. G uh, excuse me, lamb, type, Jesus, real thing, anti-type. Does it make sense? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what God was studying. Jesus was studying the shadow. Someone says, but Jesus didn't have the book of Hebrews. You're right. But he had the book of Leviticus. Am I right? Yes. And he studied the first five books of the Bible. Do you know that every Jew in the time of Christ, every Jew knew the first five books of the Bible by memory? It was a requirement. Jesus had Genesis from Genesis 1 all the way to Genesis 50 in his mind. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And by the age of 12, every Jew knew the first five books of the Bible or the Torah by heart. Now, my brothers and sisters, did he have Leviticus, yes or no? Yes. Now, I gave you some homework. Now, you thought I forgot about it. I can look at your face. You say, oh, you forgot about homework. I'm all right. No, you're not all right. <laughs> and if I'm going to be a good teacher, I know you look at me. You know what you're saying to me? You're saying, you can't be a good teacher and not ask me about my homework. Ask me about my homework. So, I'm not going to let you down. Amen. So now, question. Did you do your homework? Yes. Now, I'm going to know if you did it in a little while. So keep sitting now. I'm going to know in a little while. What chapter? Leviticus. What verse? All, all right. Well, that's all you have to do. Is that right? No. What else? Great, yeah, great converse. What chapter? Prophecy fulfilled. Did you read it? Yes. What page? Yes. All right. We, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. How many feasts were spoken of in that chapter, Leviticus 23? Seven. seven. Why? The whole Bible is built on the number seven. You'll find that God finishes everything, and guess what? Seven. Seven feasts. Do you know those feasts? All right. Tell me the first feast. Now, in fact, let me, let me test you now, just before I forget. Let me test you now. What's the first feast? Tell me the first feast. Passover. What's the second feast? Oh, wait a minute, I, I, I'm beginning to think you didn't do your homework now. What's the second feast? What's the second feast? Unleavened bread. What's the third feast? First fruits. Now, now, now shame on, now, look, we're going to say it together, shame on you. <laughs> What's the third feast? Nah, third feast, third feast. First fruits. Third feast. First fruits. That's third feast. First fruits. Fourth feast. Pentecost. Fifth feast. Feast of trumpets. Sixth feast. Day of atonement. Seventh feast. Feast of tabernacles. Eighth feast. Now follow, follow, follow. Very important. Follow, follow, follow. Very important. Follow. Seven feasts. Now, my brother and sister, it finishes at the seven feasts. Now, listen to me, brothers and sisters. What was Jesus studying in the shadow? Which one of the shadows was Jesus studying to let him know the great clock of time? Which one was Jesus studying? Talk to me, somebody. He was studying feast number one. What was feast number one called? Now, we're going to prove that in a moment. Go to Matthew 26. What book did I say? Go to Matthew 26. Now somebody say, are you sure about that? How do you know he was saying that? I'm going to show you from the Bible. Jesus himself will tell you. Go to Matthew 26. 
Because the burden of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is this plan. Now, my brother and sister, he was studying his first feast. Now, look at this on the screen for a moment. How many feasts were there? Seven. Seven. Now, I want you to read this with me. You're going to Matthew 26, and when you get there, hold your thumb in Matthew 26. I'll tell you the verse in a little while. Now, on the screen, we had a homework, which was not just Leviticus 23, but Great Controversy, page what? Now, this is in the middle of your homework. Let's read it together. What does it say? It says, arguments drawn from what? The Old Testament what? Give me another name for type. Give me another name for type. Give me another name for shadow. Now, my brothers and sisters, what this was talking about was the early Adventists in 1844 because they recognized after the great disappointment, they recognized that the reason why Jesus didn't come to the earth as William Miller taught was because Jesus moved in heaven from one apartment to the other. He moved from the holy place where? Where? To the most holy place of heavenly sanctuary. What date? What date? October 22nd. When? Do you know that that just passed a few days ago? 175 years. That means something. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find out that how did they know that Jesus moved in heaven on not just 1844, the year. How did they know the month, October? How did they know the date, October 22nd? How did Adventists know this? We're going to find out that they knew it the exact same way that Jesus knew the year he was going to die. The same way that Jesus knew the month he was going to die. The same way that Jesus knew the day he was going to die. And the same way that Jesus knew the hour he was going to die. They found the great clock of time. Now, let me show you that. Let me show you what it says. It says, arguments drawn from the Old Testament types or, give me another name, give me another name, shadows, also pointed to the autumn or fall. October is the autumn, fall. Autumn as the time when the event, remember now, we must understand events, represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary, Daniel 8, 14, must take what? This. Now, how do they understand October 22nd, 1844? It says this was made not clear, but it was made what? Very clear as attention was given to the, what does manner mean? Way. By the manner in which the types or the shadows relating to the first advent of Christ had been fulfilled. So the first advent, Jesus came to the earth the first time. And when they studied the types of the Old Testament, the Levitical types and shadows of the sanctuary, they found that the lamb and everything he did, it happened in a particular way as it pointed to the first coming of Christ and they were amazed at something. Watch what they found out about the types. Look at the manner. Watch what it says. Two things they found out. It says, the slaying of the Passover lamb was a... Was a... Give me another name. Was a... Type. It says the plain of Passover lamb was a shadow. Does the Bible say so? Yes. It says Christ our Passover is sacrificed how? Where is that in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says these types were fulfilled in two ways. How many ways? First, the type was fulfilled as it related to the events. As it relates to the what? So first, the types were, re, uh, were fulfilled in the manner that the event took place. Second, it was fulfilled as it related to time. What were the two things that it, the shadows were filled with? It was for the shadows were filled by the event and by the... I'll explain in just a moment. Now, it says these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the, the time. Now, in other words, when it says that the shadow was fulfilled by the event, that means that what the shadow did in type, that that event happened. In other words, in the Passover, what happened to the lamb on Passover? What happened to the lamb in the Passover? Did he live? What happened to the Passover? He died. So what would have to happen in order for type to be any type? Then the true lamb, the antitype, who was the antitype? Talk to me. Jesus would have to what? Did that event take place? Yes or no? Is our salvation based on that event? Yes or no? This is the redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, this tells me that that event, that shadow happened. Now, but not only did the prophecy fulfill as to the event, it had to happen, guess what? At the time that the shadow said it would take place. Now, I want to ask you a question. Was there a time for the Passover? Yes or no? What was the month of the Passover? 
first month. What was the name of that month? Abed. What was the day of the Passover? 14 day. Does the Bible say so? Where? Leviticus 23. I gave it to you for homework. Now my brothers and sisters, it told us not just the day, it told us when in that day the lamb would die. You know what it said? In the evening. If you look in the Hebrew, it means between the two evenings. And that between the two evenings takes you to a particular time. Between the two evenings takes you to guess what time? 3 p.m. And for 1,500 years, the Jews killed the Passover lamb every year on the 14th day of the first month Abib at 3 p.m. on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, this gets good. Oh, this is good. Man, this is good. Man. Now, even I'm by myself, I'm telling you, this is good, brothers and sisters. Now, watch this. Watch, watch. Now, I want to make sure you understand this. It says, on the 14th day of the first Jewish month, the very what? Day and month on which for 15 long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain, Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted the feast, which was to commemorate his own death, and the lamb of God was taken away to sin the world. That what? Same night he was taken by wicked hands to be what? Crucified and what? Now I want to make sure you understand this. You know if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read the Gospels when it comes to the cross, Gethsemane, you read Desire of Ages, a beautiful pictures in Desire of Ages on the chapter, it is finished. It paints the picture of, uh, of the Gospels. It says that Jesus was getting ready to die. And do you know that it was literally the 14th day of the first month uh, when Jesus was taken by the mob on that night? Fifth, 14 day. When Jesus was taken and arrayed from place to place. And then guess what? At three o'clock, Jesus was already hanging on the cross. He had been there for six hours. Bible says from the third to the ninth hour. But guess what time the ninth hour is? It's 3 p.m. At 2.58, you know, those Jews were stickers for time. They, they tithed on mint and constant. I mean, they were timely, stickers, everything. So at 2.58, that priest was already there. 2.59, the priest was holding up his hand, getting ready to stay the lamb. So that at 3 o'clock exactly, the priest would come down and kill the Passover lamb. But guess what? When you read the Bible, at 3 o'clock, Jesus got ready to die. He gave it to the ghost. He said, it is what? When he said that and shouted, all of a sudden, the temple in the sanctuary rent from the top to the bottom, saying this system was over on earth. And then, brothers and sisters, the Bible says there was a great earthquake. Do you know what Spirit Prophecy brings out when the earthquake took place? The priest had the knife literally in his hand, and as he got ready to slay at 3 o'clock, he got ready to bring the knife down, but the earthquake startled the priest. Knocked his hand back. He dropped the knife because that lamb didn't have to die. That was only the type. But at the death of Jesus on 3 p.m., type had met, guess what? Anti-type. And Jesus died on time, my friends. This is what this means. It says the very day and month on that, that same night he was taking my wicked hands to be crucified and slain. My brothers and sisters, this is what happened. He died on time. I want to ask you a question. Is did he resurrect on time? Yes. Did he get baptized on time? Yes. Did he go to the holy place on time in 31 AD? Yes. Did he go to the most holy place on time in 1844? Yes. Will Jesus come back on time? Yes. This is the great clock of time. Now, my brothers and sisters, what we're going to find out is that the Passover was not the end of that type or shadow. It was only the yes. Now, why is it that most people say, well, when Jesus said it is finished, that that's everything is because we don't understand the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the how many places? Three. How many symbols? Two. Lamb, priest. Now someone said, well, why would there be three places and only two symbols? Well, let me explain. The outer court, which is the first place, that's the work of the lamb. In the holy place, which is the second place, that's the work of the priest. In the most holy place, which is the third place, that's still the work of the So though there are three places, there are only two great works that needs to be done represented by Jesus as lamb and priest, as alpha and omega, as first and last, as beginning and end. He starts as a lamb. So I want to ask the question, when Jesus said it is finished, most people think that's the end of the plan of redemption. That's only the beginning. So what did he mean when Jesus, what did he mean when he said it is finished at the cross? He was saying, listen to me, my work as a lamb is done. But his work as a priest 
had just begun. I like that. You like that? Let's say it again. That when Jesus died on the cross and said it is finished, what he meant was, he explained it clearly. He said, behold the Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world, he's dying. His work as a lamb was done, but his work as a priest had just begun. That's the plan. And when you understand the plan, you will see the beauty of the man. Now, my brothers and sisters, when Jesus finished his working out of court as a lamb, he went into the sanctuary. That's where he is right now. We're going to explain and study it as we go further. Now, my brothers and sisters, how do we know that? Someone says, well, that doesn't show me that he was studying the Passover and that's how he knew he was going to die. Well, let me let Jesus tell you. Go to Matthew 26. What book did I say? Matthew 26. Let the Bible explain itself. Look at Matthew, the 26th chapter. Go to Matthew chapter 26 and notice what the Bible says in Matthew 26. What is the burden of this? The plan of what? Redemption. Now look at Matthew 26 and let's pick up in verse 3. Matthew chapter 26 and let's pick up in verse 3. Look at the Bible. Look at the text. Young man, young man. Look on with the text. It's very good, very good. Good young man, good, good. Matthew 26 verse 3. That's my friend from yesterday. Praise the Lord. Verse 3. Let's read it together. The Bible says in verse 3, it says, Then assembled together the what? Chief priests. And the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called what? Yeah. You know what they're getting ready to do? They're getting ready to consult and have a secret meeting of how they can kill Jesus. How they can stop his ministry. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know what day this was that they were trying to do this? It was Wednesday. We'll prove it in a moment. It was Wednesday. Now, what should the priests have been doing on Wednesday when they're planning to kill Jesus? What should they have been doing? They should have been preparing for a prayer meeting. Yeah. Isn't that what they should have been preparing for? <laughs> prayer meeting. But instead of preparing for a prayer meeting, you know what they were doing? They were thinking about how to end the ministry of Christ. It doesn't look like you understand what I'm saying. Uh, let me just use an example. Not that it would ever take place, but let me just give you a parable. It would almost be like we're doing a ministry here and that there will be secret plans by leadership to stop this meeting by Wednesday. No, no, listen, that would never happen here. I'm just giving you a parable. You understand? So now at Wednesday, they're having a secret meeting. Question, did they know that they were trying to kill Jesus? Did they know when they were meeting? Yes. Did Jesus know? So the meeting wasn't so secret, was it? And so, uh, <laughs> let me continue. The Bible says in verse 4, it says, and consulted that they might take Jesus, how? By subtility. What do you mean subtility? What do I mean? What do I mean? They were hiding, secretive. It said by subtility and do what? And kill him. Verse 5. But they said not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among what? But guess what? Jesus knew about this secret meeting. Remember, the Lord did nothing but reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, how do I know? Look at verse 2. The Bible says, you know. Don't guess this. He knew the time. You know that after how many days? Two days is what? Talk to me, somebody. What did he know was coming in two days? What was he studying then? The feast of Passover or the shadow of Passover. And look at what he said. He said the feast of Passover and the son of man is betrayed to be what? He knew that he was going to be crucified and die as the antitypical lamb, Jesus Christ, on the Passover day. Jesus understood it. Now what day was Passover? You know in the world they call it good what? Friday. So then what were two days before? What's two days before Friday? Wednesday. That's what was happening. You'll find in the Bible that the devil always tries to cut something in the midst of the week. So now my brothers and sisters, as we study the Bible, Jesus understood when he was going to die. Did he know the year he was going to die? Yes. Month he was going to die. Yes. Day he was going to die. Yes. Hour he was going to die. How? By the great clock of time studying the what? Shadows. But the Passover was not the end of the shadows. It was shadow number one. How many shadows? Seven. Now notice I have one through six down here. And do you notice that I don't have seven right here? Where do I have seven? I separate seven and put it way up here. Why would I do that? You think it just messed up and fell up there? Is there a reason for that? Yes. You know what the reason is? The first six happened down here on earth. The seventh feast didn't happen on earth. The seventh feast happens, guess where? In heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that the seventh feast has to happen on? Now, watch. What's the name of that feast anyway? It's called the Feast of Tabernacle. Now, watch what the prophet says. Great Converse 399. It says, in like manner, let's continue, the 
Give me another name for types. Shadows which relate to the... So not only the first advent shadows, but also the second advent shadows. It says the types which relate to the second advent, not might, but what? Must be fulfilled when? At the time pointed out in the what? Symbolic service. So that the first four feasts had to do with the first advent of Christ. And the last three feasts had to do with the second advent of Christ. Now, I have six feasts. You'll find out that if we're in the final generation, the final generation in the shadow happens between the sixth feast and the seventh feast. When does the final generation take place? Between the what? Sixth feast and the seventh feast. Guess where we are in 2019? Between the sixth feast and the seventh feast. Now, we're going to prove this. Now, my brother and sister, what is the sixth feast? Talk to me. What is the sixth feast? The day of atonement or the cleansing of the... Now, I want to ask you a question. What is the type of the second coming of Christ in the day of atonement? In the day of atonement, how does the second coming of Christ, how is it typified? How is it, how is it typified? Well, on the day of atonement, the priest, he moves from the outer court, he goes into the whole place, he goes where? Into the what? Now, where is this sanctuary, the antitype? Not the, the type, but the antitype. It's, when you read Hebrews 8, it's where? Where is it? Where then is the antitypical outer court? Uh, the best way to understand it, if you look at the furniture, it tells you where things happen. Let me give you an example. Let me make it practical. If you know the furniture of a room, you know where the room is. Let me look at your house. If you see a, a toilet, where am I? Well, at least we should be, amen. <laughs> There will be a problem if your house, you, you're not in the bathroom and you're in the toilet. But the furniture of the room tells you the room. Bathroom, where am I? Well, bathtub, where am I? Bathroom. All right. Stove. Vitamix. <laughs> All right. So the furniture of the place tells us where the room is. Does it make sense? Yes or no? I want to ask you a question then. So in the sanctuary, they're furnished in each of these rooms. So if you look at the furniture, you know where you are. Now here, this furniture right here, this is the altar. You know what happened at this? Where did the lamb do? The lamb was what? Slain right here in the type. The lamb was never slain in here. The lamb was never slain in here. The lamb was always slain in the outer court. Are you following me? So then if I find where Jesus died, I have not the type of the outer court, because Jesus was not a type, he was the anti-type. So if I find where Jesus died, I find the antitypical out of court, the real out of court. Does it make sense? Yes. Question. So where did Jesus die? In heaven on or on earth? on earth? So where is the antitypical out of court? Earth. earth. So then in the type, this out of court, whatever happens here is a shadow of what happens on the earth. And whatever happens here is a shadow of what happens where? In heaven. So if you look at the entire plan, you will see everything God's going to do in earth and heaven in the plan of redemption. That's the message. So now on the day of atonement, the priest in heaven moves in heaven from the holy place to the... But on the day of atonement, he doesn't stay in the sanctuary. He then comes where? Now I'm going to ask you a question. So when the priest comes back to the outer court, that is a shadow of what? The second coming of Jesus Christ. That happens not at the beginning of the day of atonement. It happens at the end of the day of atonement. And this says, the types which relate to the, that's these types, must be fulfilled at the, so my brothers and sisters, that tell me is that Jesus was born on, he died on, he resurrected on, and he's going to come back again on, I'm telling you, this is the great clock of time. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's why we have to begin studying this. Now, how did that get there? I thought we were talking about time. Did you mess up my slides back there? Did you mess up my slides back there? You put this up here? No, no, that's where it should be. That's good. I'm making sure you're following too. You're not just back there just taking a picture of this. Every one of us are here, so we should be listening. We shouldn't be back there just talking and playing. We should be listening. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know what this is? You know what this is right here? It's Big Ben. What's Big Ben known for? Where, where is Big Ben? It's in England. What is it known for? It's known for something very specific. What is it known for? It's known for time. 
You know, the Big Ben is called the great clock of time because it is supposed to be the clock that all the other clocks originally were set by. Now, my brothers and sisters, interesting enough, when you study the history of this, there's something called, you know, we, we, in, in Atlanta, what time zone are you on? Uh, what time zone is California on? Or you, whatever you call it, some people call it Pacific, some people call it West, but you know, different time zones. Now, you know, time zones is not an old thing. Time zones, the idea of time zones is about only 130 years old. You can Google, don't do it now, but you can do it later when you get home. <laughs> some people trust Google more than they trust God. But you will find out that when you do it, there's something called the International Meridian Conference. It took place in 1884. It was in the United States. And you will find that the so-called civiliz uh, civilization of the world uh, came together and they tried to recognize we need to have a time where all of us can work together. Because remember now, technology was bridging the earth. Communication, travel, planes, building, all this type of thing uh, with cars, trains, so forth. It was making earth a little world after all. And as a result, in order to do business together, somebody work, wakes up on another part of time, somebody is sleeping. Somebody is sleeping, somebody, but in order to do business together, you have to sync time. So as a result, they said, we need to come together so we can do business. It was for business. And as they did that, they came up and they, they, they came together here in 1884 in October. And eventually, 24 of those nations came together and they said, we'll use Greenwich, England as the prime meridian, which means basically that's the place that time would start from. That's the zero place. And you will find out where you are hours from Greenwich, England, and it makes that, that become the center of the earth. Now, I won't bore you with the details, but the point is, there were two nations that did not accept that, and one of those was France. So if you meet a Frenchman today and you tell him 9 o'clock, he might get there at 9.09 because what they said was they still believe the time zone nine minutes later. So if you are nine minutes later, just recognize he's from France and don't put it on him, all right? All right. So now, my brothers and sisters, but what it did, it became known as the great clock of time. Now, you know that I'm not spending my time telling you about Greenwich, England. You can go to England if you want, or you don't have to go to England. There's another great clock of time I'm interested in. Now watch. Watch what the prophet says. In the book Desire of Ages 31, let's read that together. It says, the Savior's what? <coughs> Coming. Was foretold where? where? What verse? Genesis. He said, I will come. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and what else? Prophets. Keeping alive the hope of his appearing. And yet, what? He came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after the century passed away. The voices of the prophets, what? Ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel. And many were ready to exclaim, the days are prolonged, and how much? They said, look, it looks like the time is passing. But guess what? But like the stars in their vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes, guess what? knows what? No haste and no delay. It means it always happens on time. It says, through the symbols of the great darkness and smoking furnace, God revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel where? In Egypt. And he had declared that the time of their sojourning should be how long? Do you know that before Israel ever went into Egypt in the great clock of time, he told them that they would be in, Israel, uh, in Egypt for 400 years and they came out at the exact same day that God told them they would come out. Why? Because of the great clock of time. It says, against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled where? Amen. On the self same day. Same day. That's Exodus 24, 12, 41. Appointed in the divine promise, it came to pass that all of the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of what? So the exodus happened on, but now watch, it says so in like manner. In heaven's council, the hour for the coming of Christ had what? Been determined. And when, I love this part, when the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was what? Born where? In Bethlehem. The Bible says in Galatians 4, 4, he was born in the fullness of time. Now, that meant that if he was born on time, and he was baptized on, and he started his public ministry on, and he died on, and he resurrected on, and he went back to heaven in 31 AD on, and he moved into the most holy place October 22nd, 1844 on, then Jesus is coming back on. This is the great clock of time. And my question is, in 2019, is this the time? Is that a good question? 
The only way to know we've got to follow the same what? Because the shadows didn't stop with the Passover. Now, what we have to do, and our time is gone tonight, ooh, ooh, so we better be, we bring this, get ready to bring this close. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to give you some homework. I couldn't let you go without homework. Am I right? I'm going to give you some homework, but watch now. This is not the real great clock of time. Guess what sets the real great clock of time? The sanctuary. Plan of redemption sets that clock of time. And so since that's not the clock of time, let me get my friend. My friend's with me right now. Now watch this, my friend. I think you'll like this. Now watch this now. Since this is not the real great clock of time, let's get rid of that clock. You want to get rid of that clock with me? Let's get rid of it. Boom! Right, that clock is gone. Now let's see it again. Let's bring it back up. Now let's get rid of that clock. You ready to get rid of Boom! So that clock, that's not the real great clock of time. The real great clock of time is not on earth or in England. It's where? Talk to me. In heaven. And that sanctuary, the plan of redemption, sets the great clock of time and guess how long it sets it for? 7,000 years. God finishes everything in what? Sevens. That great clock of time started ticking, not when Adam was born. Not when Adam was born. Remember, what set a limit? We studied this yesterday. What set a limit? Sin. So once sin into the world, the clock started ticking. And the only way to find out where we are in the clock, we've got to go through the what? Shadows. Jesus did this to know when he was going to die. He knew his time. And that same clock that showed the time of the death of Jesus is the same clock that's going to show us the final generation. If it takes us from the first generation back here down to the final generation over here. And remember, we studied yesterday, this work of redemption cannot go forever. It has a what? Amen. We looked at this. We saw that the sanctuary sets this limit. And that one Jewish year represents the whole plan of redemption. And the only way to understand this, we've got to go into that sanctuary and begin to study. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that the sanctuary is built on cycles of seven and that the whole system of types or, give me another name, and symbols was a... Now, remember what I said last night before we close? That if I took 7,000 years and, con and, and acted it out in one year, what did I just do to that 7,000 years? Would that be compact? Now, we're going to find out that we're gonna, that's exactly what happened. We're going to find out that in the sanctuary, God took 7,000 years and illustrated it in one year of the Jewish sanctuary that took us from Feast 1 to Feast 7. And God wants us to understand this. Everything is built on cycles of seven. We're going to find this. In fact, this is what the prophet says. Great Converse 659, 660. It says, for how long? For 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to what? Tremble. He has made the world as a? And destroyed the cities where? How long does this happen? How long? Now, I'm going to tell you something. Now, what this is, this is in the Bible. What, 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 what the prophet's quoting is in the Bible. It says, for 6,000 years, his prison house has received what? Let me show you that. You, you, look like you don't believe me. Let me go. Let's go there. Go to, go to Isaiah. Go in your Bible to Isaiah 14. Go to Isaiah 14. Let's go there quickly. Isaiah 14. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring out some final points in these last few minutes, help us to understand the importance of the time in which we're living and the need of running to Jesus before it is too late. Give us your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 14. We want to find the exact word. It says, he made the world as a wilderness. Speaking of Satan. Now look at Isaiah 14. Beginning in verse 12, let's, in Isaiah 14, verse 12, let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 12? What does it say? How art thou fallen from heaven, O what? Who is Lucifer? Who is Lucifer? Satan. Satan. So just before he was Satan, he was Lucifer. Now, going down to verse 17, let's jump down to verse 17. What does it say? That made the world as a what? Is that what it says? It says he made the world as a what? And destroyed the cities thereof. Let's continue. He says, made the world as a witness. What else did he do in verse 17? And destroy the cities. Do you know that every city that has been destroyed today in America has been destroyed by the devil himself, engineered by Satan? It says, and what else did he do after he destroyed the cities? There, there up, that open not the house of his what? For how long was people going to the prison house of Satan? What did it say? How long? Question. What is this prison house? Now look at the text. Let me show you that from the Bible. Let's continue. It says in verse 17, open up the house of his prison. And verse 18 says, all the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory. Everyone where? Everyone where? In his own house. What is the house? Verse 19. But thou art cast out of the... So what is the, the prison house that Satan has locked up? What is it called? The grave. Let me show you another text. We'll come back here. Go to Job chapter 17. Let me make sure we're right. Go to the book of Job. 
Because we don't need to make it up. The Bible explains itself. Precept must be upon precept. Line must be upon line. Here a little and there a little. The Bible explains itself. Now notice what the Bible says in Job 17. In Job 17. Look what the Bible says. We want to know what the house is that Satan was using to lock up God's people. Look what the Bible says in Job. After Ezra. After Nehemiah. After Esther. You get to the book of what? Job 17. And we want to read verse 13 together. Job 17 verse 13. Are you there? Let me know by saying amen. What does verse 13 say all together? What does the Bible say in verse 13? It says, if I wait, the grave is what? All right. So what is this house? The Bible's talking about it is the what? Grave. So now let's go back here. It says, he made the world as a wilderness, destroyed the cities thereof. He opened not the house of his prisoners. What is it talking about? He opened not the grave. It says, for 6,000 years, his prison house or the grave has received God's people and he would have held them captive forever. But what? Christ, Christ has broken his bond and set the... So at the end of 6,000 years, God is going to open the grave. Is that what that's telling me? Yes or no? Yes. At the end of 6,000 years, God is going to open the grave. Now question, how does God open the grave? Where is that in the Bible? Go to 1 Thessalonians. Let's go, let's go there. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Bible is unfolding the plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. It's the same plan. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Because at the end of 6,000 years, God is going to open up the grave. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. And we want to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 16. The 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? For the Lord himself shall descend where? That's at the end of the day of atonement. He's coming out of the sanctuary in heaven. From heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of Christ, and the dead in Christ shall do what? Then we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're never going to be separated from him at that time. So my brothers and sisters, what event opens up the grave? What event? So that means that the second coming of Christ must happen at the end of 6,000 years. Now, my brothers and sisters, does the Bible speak of this? Yes. Go to Revelation. What book of the Bible? Go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. Now, watch now. At the end of this 6,000 years, it says that God is going to open, set the prisoners free. It says, the king of the nation, all of them lying glory, everyone in his own house or the grave. And then the next paragraph goes on to say, then what's going to happen at the 6,000? It says, for a thousand years, Satan will wander to and fro in the desolate earth to behold the results of his rebellion against the law of God. For how long he's going to do this? Does the Bible speak of this thousand year period? Yes. Where? Revelation. Revelation. Chapter 20. Look at Revelation 20. You see, do you believe that the prophet is right? Yes or no? Yes. Everything that prophet says, guess what? The Bible says. And everything the Bible says, the... Now if you believe that, you're almost a seven day Adventist. Now watch, Revelation 20, look what it says in verse 2. Revelation 20, verse 2, what does the Bible say? In verse 2 it says, And he laid hold on the, who is the dragon? That's a symbol or a shadow of Satan. He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is who? The devil and Satan, and bound him, how long? So does the Bible speak of this thousand year period, yes or no? Now is this the first thousand years of human history or the last thousand years? All right, we'll see that in just a moment. Look what it says in verse 6. Let's read verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the... That's the resurrection when Jesus comes. It sets the prisoners free. On such the second death have what? But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. How long? Now what's going to happen after that thousand years is over? Verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And what's going to happen? Verse 9. And they went up on the breath of the earth and come past the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And talk to me, somebody. Fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? So at the end of the 7,000 year period, Satan is going to be destroyed with sinners in hell fire. And everything is going to be brought to an end on this earth like that. And then what's God going to do? Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a what? For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So we saw that Eden lost 
will become Eden restored. Heaven will come down to this earth at the end of 7,000 years. 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? Now, that's in the book of Revelation itself. Now, look at it. Look at it. In the context of the book of Revelation. Context. From chapters 1 through chapter 22. Without fail. Context. How many things is used to cover the whole period of something? Seven. How many candlesticks? Seven. How many churches? Seven. How many plagues? Seven. How many seals? Seven. Seven, seven, seven. The beast there has how many heads? Seven. And in each case, seven is never the first. Seven is always the last. Seven is always the limit. Seven is always the final. And after it, there's no more. So without fail, from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, seven always marks the limit. I want to ask you a question. Then if John wanted to deal with the last thousand year period of human history in context, what number would he have to attribute to that last thousand years? So then how many thousand years must transpire? Seven. Now I'm suggesting that tonight, tomorrow, we'll prove it from the Bible. We're going to prove it from the Bible. Seven thousand years. Now my brothers and sisters, this tells me then that the last generation or the limit generation is simply the generation on earth that reaches not the 7,000. Because remember, a thousand is spent in heaven, but the last on earth is what? So the limit generation or the final generation is simply the generation that reaches the 6,000 year. Thy way, O God, is in the? And all we got to do is follow the shadow. So the question then is, when does this take place? Because you know what that is? That's the Feast of Tabernacles, which happens in heaven. This is the shadow. Now, this is the sun now. The sun casts its light. It is an object. It casts the shadow. And then wherever the shadow falls, it gives us the time. In the morning, evening, it just changed direction of the same thing. The sanctuary is God's sundown. So Jesus, the son of righteousness, his work in heaven has a light. And it shines upon us in the sanctuary and gives us the shadow that takes us from beginning to end. Now, my brothers and sisters, you will find that these shadows have the first coming and these shadows end with the second coming of Christ. We found out that the, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time. It has to happen on time, just like the first advent. Now, my question is, brothers and sisters, at the end of the day of atonement, that means that when the priest comes out of the most holy place from the heavenly sanctuary, he's coming back to the earth. And that represents the, and that has to happen on, and that means, brothers and sisters, the end of the day of atonement has to happen on, and the key is, the sixth feast has to finish by the 6,000 years, so that the seventh feast can finish by the 7,000 years, because God finishes everything in, so now my question is, brothers and sisters, when we come to the seventh day of the week, are we at the beginning of the week or the week end? So my brothers and sisters, all we have to do is recognize if we follow the what? Shadow. Remember that shadow? You know what's going to happen. And all you do is follow the shadow. Are you following the shadow? What number is that? Are you following the shadow? What number is that? Are you following the shadow? What number is that? Are you following the shadow? What number is that? That is when the final generation takes place, at the end of six. And then the seventh takes place not on earth but in? I want you to learn this phrase with me as we're closing. All sevens take us to heaven. My teacher taught me that before he was laid to rest. And I never forget, I bless God for raising up that man of God that brought me into this mission to understand this thing. Now listen to me. All sevens take us to heaven. Would you say that with me? All sevens take us to heaven. All sevens take us to heaven. Now, my brother and sister, we're going to find out that seven is not going to be celebrated on earth. Seven is going to happen in, and it's going to happen on, guess what? Time. 6,000 years on earth, 1,000 years in heaven, and then all of it is going to bring us, Eden law is going to be Eden return. Now, if we understand that in 2019, what we need to find out in 2019 is, how close are we to that? Do you want to know, yes or no? Yes. Now, let me give you some homework. What number is that? Do you remember what we found out about seven? It says the world population has reached how many? Now, when was the last time the world reached seven billion? Noah's flood. Noah's flood. What happened after that? 
The flood, climate changed, and then what happened? The world came to an end the first time. So then Jesus said, as it was in the days of, so shall I be in the coming of the Son of. So then we should see after the world reaches 7 billion, we should see climate change, and we should see the world get ready to come to a what? We looked at this last night. Now, we found this, we looked at the United Nations stat. Now, what year did the world reach, what year did the world reach 7 billion? What year? At the end of 2011. So at the end of 2011, the world reached how many? That's the population that the world was in before it was destroyed. Jesus said that's how it's going to be in the coming Son of Man. So that we should be looking for the final generation after 2011. Because that's the, the, the time frame. Now 2012 comes on the scene and something happens. Now I can't tell you what happened in 2012. We'll talk about it before it's over. But then something happened in 2013. Anybody know what happened in 2013? Somebody comes on the scene. It says Pope Francis, the man who won over the world in how long? Now, there's a reason why this pope came in 2013. There's a reason for that time. You remember something happened just before he came on the scene. Pope Benedict XVI stepped down. Am I right? Had that ever, ever happened before? There was another time happened before. How long before? 500 years, 600 years before. Something was happening. But something special happened to make him step down. Now, I don't know how God can step down, but that's what happened. He said he, he, he stepped down. But now in 2013, all that took place. This pope came on the scene and the historian says, look what the historian says. The historian says this pope is different. It says, we have never seen what? A pope become so popular in just a couple of what? That's a French historian, expert on religion. But we're going to find out the Bible says that the pope is going to have to get the attention of the world just prior to the 6,000 years. We're going to show you that from the text. And then what's going to happen, brothers and sisters? Because it's not just the pope. This is happening now because of the great clock of... All of the world is going to run into this. Then it says, planet has only until what? To stem catastrophic what? Why? Something is happening to this earth, and it has to do with what's going on in the sanctuary. My brothers and sisters, it's showing us something where it says here. It says, if we do not change course by what year? We risk missing the point where we can avoid runaway climate change. Brothers and sisters, something is lining up for a reason. Something has happened. We found out that this says, why the fall of the American Empire will come by what? Why is it all saying now? Because of the great clock of? Five. But my brothers and sisters, guess what's happening? 2020 is no what? Pope Francis invites religious pact. We talked about this. Then it says, McHale wants to wrap up Trump impeachment trial. What is taking over the news right now? What's taking over the news all over the world? What's, getting the what's all in the news? What's all in the news? Talk to me. We need to understand why. My brothers and sisters, no, not a smoke screen. No, no, definitely not a smoke screen. It's real. This, this, this is real. It's prophecy. It's, it's part of the real issue. And the reason why we don't understand it, though, is because we don't understand the sanctuary. We need to find out that what's happening with this impeachment is doing something to bring the Day of Atonement to an end. And the only way we can understand this is we got to go back to the sanctuary. And this shows us, without a shadow of a doubt, that 2019 is giving way to something prophetically because we're looking at the time of the beginning of the yeah. Now, the only way to understand this, we've got to understand between the sixth feast and seventh feast. Seventh feast starts when Jesus comes the second time. We're going to prove that. So what do we need at the study in the shadows? What shadows we need to understand is the shadows of the sixth feast and the seventh feast. That's where we are in, in the final generation. The sixth feast and the what? What's the sixth feast called? Day of Atonement, cleansing the sanctuary. What's the seventh feast called? The Feast of? Yeah. Now, your homework. Now, I know you're looking sad. Please don't let me go without homework. So I'm not going to let you go without homework. I want you to go back to Leviticus 23. But this time, I want you to focus on the Feast of Tabernacles. So the what? Because remember, the shadow has to be fulfilled in two ways. Based on the event. And then it has to happen on? I want you to study the Feast of Tabernacles, the shadow. And if you study the Feast of Tabernacles, the shadow, in Leviticus 23, about 33, and to the end of the chapter, 33, about 10 verses, just short verses, 10 verses, and try to look for the shadow. And then reread Great Controversy 398. And go back through it, refresh your mind about it, and then we'll come back, and if you do that, you'll be ahead of the game. We're trying to understand the Feast of and the Day of Atonement, because if we can understand when the Day of Atonement ends and the Feast of Tabernacle begins, we can understand the final generation, and this will begin to start making sense. Now, why is that so? Because these feasts are like holidays. They're like what? Holidays. 
Do you know that if you didn't even know the dates, you can know where you were in the year just by holidays? If you know the date. For example, tell me some holidays that exist in, in, in America that's celebrated every year. Thanksgiving. That's coming up. I knew you were thinking about Thanksgiving. Your stomach. <laughs> what else? Christmas. New Year. All right. Now, at the beginning of the year, give me, give me some of the beginning of the year. New Year's Day. Give me another feast. Valentine's Day. That's February. Then you get to about the middle. Give me one in the middle. The, the, the people of the world have celebrated Halloween. Uh, then as you get toward the end, you have Thanksgiving. Then at the end of that, when you know at Christmas, you know you're almost at the end of that thing. Am I right? All right. So now, listen, if I told you and you woke up and you didn't know what day it was, what date it was, and all of a sudden you got up and, you, and I said, look, in two days, Christmas is coming. Where are you? You are just about December 25th. So if we get to the holiday and know where we are, we will say, ah, it's just about 6,000 years. We'll be able to figure it out without the date if we understand the shadow. And everything is beautiful in its time. The beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man and it happens on, I want to know, what do you say? And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. We have a few short months to for a few short years at the most. Nothing else is more important than getting ready right now. We've got to get to know Jesus. And in order to get to know Jesus, it takes, guess what? Time to develop a friendship. Do you want to get to know Jesus, yes or no? If that's your desire tonight. Would you reverently kneel with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, the handwriting is on the wall. The world cannot continue much longer. And the same great clock of time that shows you your time, your death, your resurrection, your limit, is the same clock that shows us our time, our limit, our final generation. And so if we refuse this clock, we have to refuse your clock. And if we accept your clock, then we must accept this clock and know that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And Lord, what should it profit a man to have a job, to be faithful to that job, to be faithful to that education, to be faithful to the world, and then lose our souls? Help us to see, Lord, that the greatest thing we can do now is to get to know you for ourselves. And this takes time. In fact, I pause the prayer. Someone just raise your hand and say, Lord, I need help. I need Jesus. I want my family to get ready. I want to put down everything in this world and accept Jesus. And whatever that means, I want to embrace him so that I may become his friend. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Heavenly Father, you see the lifted hands. Whoever is watching on the Internet, please, Lord, help them to lift their hand and not just listen as entertainment, but to make a decision that there's got to be a difference. There's got to be a change. We cannot continue to bury, bury our heads in the world and in television. We've got to study our Bibles and pray and get to know you for ourselves and then help somebody else. Bless every lifted hand. We know the devil will do everything he can to keep us from coming back tomorrow. But Lord, you will bring us, you will keep us, and you will save us. We thank you, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Are you happy you're here tonight? Yes. Did you learn anything? Yes. Do you want some more? Yes. Well, tomorrow night we're continuing. What time tomorrow night? Uh-uh. Don't tell me seven. Don't tell me 659. 658. 658. Now, if we can start on time, then we can get more time to get an understanding because, see, time is running in what? Ow. Let's pray for each other. Amen? Amen. I'll be praying for you as you pray for me. May God bless you. Don't forget your homework. What's the homework? Leviticus. What particularly? Feast up and the David Atonement. And then Great Controversy, reviewing 398, so you can understand this, and we'll get back together. Let's get to know Jesus. What do you say? May God bless you. You may consider your